So good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this GFSR conference. Thank you so much for coming and for your interest in this report. I'm Mira Lewis with the Communications Department at the IMF, and joining us here today is Tobias Adrian. He's a financial counselor and the director of the Monterey Capital Markets Department. Also with us is uh, Fabio Natalici and Jason Wu, direct, Deputy Director and Assistant Director of the Monterey Capital Markets Department. Now, before we turn the floor over to you for questions, I would like to turn to Tobias uh, to begin. Tobias, uh, we see there are some bumps on the road ahead of us, especially with uh, sticky inflation in some advanced economies, amongst other financial stability issues. So could you set the stage for us on what challenges you see when you and your team uh, put together this report? Yeah, thanks so much, and I'm really excited uh, to be here uh, to see uh, uh, such an interest uh, in in our work. Um, uh, so let me let me first start uh, with a with a baseline uh, as a as a setting, and uh, what we have seen is really a, a tremendous amount of optimism in financial markets. Uh, our global baseline, as uh, Pierre Olivier explained in the previous press conference is one of a global soft landing, i.e. Uh, inflation is expected to return to target in countries around the world, while economic activity slows, but uh, we don't foresee a global recession in our baseline. Um, and um, so this optimistic um, uh, scenario has really fueled uh, asset valuations in recent months uh, we have seen uh, that credit spreads have compressed even for riskier borrowers. So many countries uh, that uh, had been shut out of global capital markets uh, for the past year or year and a half have returned to capital markets since the beginning of the year. Issuance have, has resumed. And, um, you know, valuations in, in risky asset markets, stock markets in particular, uh, really have, have ratcheted up, but also in, in corporate bond markets and sovereign bond markets. Now, uh, turning to, to the risks, so there are some short-term risks and some medium-term risks. Uh, the shorter-term risks are uh, primarily uh, about um, uh, inflation and how persistent inflation is. Um, so we do forecast uh, inflation uh, to come down. Uh, but uh, there's certainly some differentiation across countries how quickly uh, inflation is coming down and what central banks have to do going forward in order to get inflation back to target. Uh, so this is one risk, and uh, that can certainly impact um, uh, valuations across asset markets. Uh, a second shorter-term risk is that uh, we do see a fairly compressed volatility, a fairly high correlation across asset markets, uh, while fundamental uncertainty continues to remain somewhat elevated. So um, uh, there are uh, certainly geopolitical tensions around the world, um, and there are, uh, there are other economic headwinds uh, that could lead to a reassessment uh, of, um, of the economic situation uh, going forward. So this uh, sort of wedge between financial market implied volatility and uncertainty uh, in the underlying economic performance is a second uh, issue that we flag. A third issue is about this narrowing of credit spreads and um, underlying uh, credit quality that is deteriorating in some corners. So broadly, the global economy is, is, is very strong. It has surprised to the upside in many countries, particularly in the US, uh, but also uh, 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 just yesterday, China announced uh, stronger than expected GDP numbers. So we see a lot of strength, but we do see certain uh, corners where default rates are rising, where there's some weakness. And so this tension in between um, you know, s credit spreads that are really narrowing, uh, but uh, some struggles in, in some corners is, is a third short-term risk. In the medium term, it's really about the buildup of vulnerabilities. Uh, already the level of debt has come up uh, globally. 
since the pandemic, um, uh, governments have stepped in aggressively to cushion the economic fallout from the pandemic. And as a result, we, see, we, we, we really see sort of like debt to GDP uh, fairly high. And um, as financial conditions have eased, uh, there is a leverage uh, that is rising uh, again in many uh, corners of the financial system as well as uh, uh, the non-financial system. And uh, that's certainly something we're watching very closely. So let me stop here and, and turn back to Mera. Thank you, Tobias. So um, I just wanted to say you can ask your questions uh, also via WebEx or uh, via the press center. And um, when you raise your hand, can you please, uh, when if I call on you, just uh, identify yourself and your outlet. OK, the lady here in the red. Wait, just one second. We're just getting you the mic. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. My name is Ray Zhou from 21st Century Bins Harold, Guangdong, China. So uh, we have a first question. Given China's um, uh, important role in global economy, as well as you just mentioned, China just announced stronger than expected GDP growth in the first quarter. So can you elaborate a little bit more on China's role in promoting global financial stability, as well as other economic activity? Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we turn to Tobias, are there any other China questions in the room? I see a gentleman here in the, in the front. Yeah, I, I guess my, uh, sorry, uh, my name is Jason. I'm uh, with uh, Tencent News from China. So uh, I guess my question is also, uh, you know, following up with uh, the lady here. Uh, so can you talk about uh, the China's, uh, you know, the role? in maintaining its uh, domestic uh, financial stability and uh, really contributing the uh, global the, uh, financial stability. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on China? No. China? OK. The lady there? Thank you. Uh, Olena Khrushchev, Ukraine's the page, by my, but my question regards uh, China. Um, quite a few years ago, there was uh, a fear that China's uh, development credits may be a risk for the financial stability. And I want to ask, uh, we have just heard on the World Economic Outlook that we have the um, weakness from the property sector and these, uh, the stimulus from the government doesn't work as effectively as it's produced, uh, as it's uh, believed to be. And I wanted to ask, is there still a risk of um, China's uh, development market and uh, real estate market to become this bomb for the financial stability as we thought several years ago. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for, uh, for your interest in China. Um, um, of course, China is, is the second largest economy in the world, so uh, we, are, we are following very closely uh, what is happening in terms of financial stability. Uh, let me start with the, with the big picture and then Fabio can go a little bit deeper on the financial sector issue. So, um, you know, as, as you noted and as I noted uh, already, uh, you know, the, the most recent uh, uh, GDP figure was above expectation. Last year, um, for uh, the whole year, uh, GDP growth was also above 5%. So the overall growth rate remains, uh, uh, you know, very strong. Um, now, uh, the challenge that uh, uh, all three of you alluded to is really from the property sector. And um, I would distinguish uh, two aspects that are very important. Uh, so the first one uh, is that investment in the property sector has been an engine of growth uh, for China for many years. And there is a marked slowdown in property investment, in particular when you look at um, uh, new construction and housing that has dropped very, very sharply. Um, and uh, that is certainly uh, a transition in terms of the growth model that authorities are very focused on. A second aspect is about the valuation of housing prices. And we have seen a decline in housing prices, uh, but it's fairly moderate uh, to date. Uh, and that is certainly a, a, a strength uh, from a financial stability uh, perspective. Um, you know, housing investment is the biggest uh, asset for most households. Um, and of course, uh, banks have exposure uh, to the housing market as well. So. 
uh, while there has been a decline in housing prices, it has not been extremely sharp. So most of the adjustment is in quantities, less so in prices, and that's a plus for financial stability. Now, in terms of assessing uh, financial sector stability, it's, it's very important to uh, uh, consider the regional heterogeneity of housing markets. So there are some uh, uh, major cities uh, that continue to perform very strongly from a housing perspective, while other provinces are somewhat weaker. Um, and so we certainly see uh, also this uh, regional disparity in terms of the banking sector. So some of the smaller banks in some of the weaker provinces are more impacted uh, than, say, uh, banks uh, in, in the stronger provinces. Uh, so let me turn to, to Fabio to elaborate a little bit more on, on these issues. Well, maybe what I can do, I can walk you through the different possible channel of contagion that we had in mind when we assessed the financial stability situation in China. <coughs> The starting point is that confidence is still not been restored, despite some measures that have been taken, like lowering mortgage rates or easing the access to purchases. We are not seeing a bottom out in the sector. As Tobias mentioned, prices are not declining as much as other historical episodes, like comparing to the U.S. subprime crisis, for example. But activity have, like so, sales and other measure activity investment. Even the prices, you can see a differentiation between new prices and existing prices. Existing home prices actually decline much more than new. That less decline of new prices help banks absorb some of the shock in a more manageable way, uh, but at the same time has been an impediment in restructuring. And you see this issue about confidence in the property uh, developer sector. The access to markets has declined, both banks and non-banks, and even the sources of pre-sales revenues coming down. That implies that they have less ability to complete projects. Less ability to complete projects means there's less, less revenues from land sales, and that it's a channel of contagion to the local governments, where for the local government funding vehicles, so these structures that are used to, uh, to finance investment, uh, they have a, mature, a wallet of maturity coming in, and there's a clear differentiation to the BS point between, for example, weak provinces and strong provinces. Another uh, signal in terms of the limited bottom line of confidence is in the equity market. From peak to trough, the equity market is down about 45%, despite recent incline. And that's another channel of transmission to the wealth management product sector, for example. So the non-banking financial institution, that sector is pretty large. It's about 110 trillion RMB, or 90% of GDP. You have seen the equity-linked funds that actually have lost quite a bit of value. And trust fact, the trust funds, obviously, that's more linked to the real estate. We also, the concern now is for the more wealth management product. Those are more tailored to retail investors, and they tend to own about 80, 90 percent in fixed income. So the concern is that if there is a losses in those funds, retailers could withdraw money. That implies because they hold significant portion of corporate bonds, that corporate bond yields would increase, and that could be a channel of transmission to funding markets to the banks. So those are some examples of possible uh, transmission channels. So the policy recommendation, as Tobias has mentioned. It's a mix of addressing macroeconomic, if you want, strength, as well as the small sector reforms. Thank you. Thank you, Fabio. Um, okay, the lady here right in the front. Thank you, Laman Zainalova from Train News Agency, Azerbaijan. My question is about the Caucasus and Central Asia region. As you know, uh, these countries are very uh, reliant, uh, heavily reliant on commodity exports. And given the fluctuations around the world in the commodity markets, uh, how does IMF uh, forecast the financial stability in the countries of this region? And what are your recommendations in order to make those countries less less vulnerable in the face of the external shocks. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for, uh, for this uh, very uh, important question. And um, uh, I, would, uh, I would recommend uh, two uh, main avenues here. Um, so the first one is really about financial sector policies. Um, so it, we are um, regularly uh, doing financial sector assessments in countries, um, including in, in the region. Um, where we really look at uh, the financial stability in the country, uh, the strength of financial sector oversight, as well as the kind of emergency uh, uh, measures uh, that the countries could deploy if adverse shocks were to hit. So this is deposit insurance, emergency lending, and, and resolution powers. And um, 
um, you know, we, we provide very detailed assessments of, um, of the strength of financial sector policies. And, um, you know, in, in all of our FSAPs, we have a number of recommendations. And, um, you know, uh, 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 following those recommendations is really our, our number one uh, priority for country authorities. Um, so that is really on the financial sector side. Uh, secondly, uh, in terms of monetary policy and macroeconomic frameworks, of course, some countries in that region have uh, more fixed exchange rates. Others uh, are inflation targeters. Um, you know, so uh, so it depends a little bit what the uh, what the uh, uh, fixed ex what the um, exchange rate regime is in terms of policy recommendations. But you know, for those uh, that are uh, either inflation targeting or are heading towards inflation targeting. You know, using uh, the exchange rate as a buffer uh, to absorb shocks is certainly a priority. Um, and, uh, you know, we are also providing, you know, granular advice to authorities in this respect. Thank you. Thank you, Tobias. Yes, the gentleman over there in the third row. Yes. Alex Brummer from the Daily Mail in London. Um, to, um, I want to ask about two asset classes which we haven't discussed very much. Firstly, why, and why do we think at the moment the gold price is so strong? Because equity markets and other markets seem to be very healthy, and normally the gold price goes in the opposite direction. That's the first. And secondly, do we think the Bitcoin might pose a systemic risk in any kind of way to the global economy? Yeah, thanks so much for uh, those, um, um, you know, important, um, uh, those questions about the two important asset classes. So, uh, indeed, the gold price uh, has reached historically high levels. Uh, and, you know, Bitcoin has, has fluctuated, uh, but also uh, reached uh, historical highs uh, earlier this year. Um, so, let me start with gold. Um, uh, we see uh, two, um, you know, drivers here. Um, so one is certainly uh, some uh, reallocation of reserve asset managers uh, towards commodities uh, that include gold, um, and that could be one contributor to, to those valuations. Uh, the second one is, of course, uh, uh, you know, a, a speculative um, a behavior. Um, you know, as I pointed out at the beginning, uh, 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 volatility in financial markets is fairly compressed, but of course, uh, uh, deeper economic uncertainty still remains fairly high. Geopolitical uncertainty remains high, and uh, gold is, is oftentimes viewed as a, as a kind of uh, hedge against those uh, broader geopolitical risks. In terms of Bitcoin uh, valuations, of course, uh, it is uh, uh, difficult to, to pin down uh, the fundamental drivers uh, of, of Bitcoin uh, valuations. Um, and, um, you know, one technical factor that uh, has played a role is um, uh, the um, um, development of ETPs, so ex ex exchange-traded products. Uh, that have been uh, allowed in the U.S. Um, so when you look at so like allocations to to Bitcoin um, since the beginning of the year, there has certainly been um, uh, you know a substantial inflow uh, in those uh, investments through the ETPs. Uh, I don't know, Jason, whether you want to uh, compliment me. Yes, I think in this regard, um, our view is the authorities should encourage um, and monitor the regulated entities on the exposures, both to um, the cryptocurrency itself, as well as some of these derivative products that, um, like ETPs that Tobias has mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, Jason and Tobias. Do you want a follow-up? Wait, we need a, a mic here. Oh, so, so the follow-up question was whether it so poses a systemic risk. So uh, we don't see it as a systemic risk at this point. Uh, but we do view it as a risk um, and um, as a potential risk going forward as well. So the IMF has worked closely with the Financial Stability Board to develop a policy framework for crypto assets. Um, and uh, this includes a, a regulatory approach as well as a broader macroeconomic policy approach. And we are currently rolling out uh, those, uh, those policies. And the goal is really... Um, to make sure that um, you know crypto assets 
um, are regulated and are, are embedded in a, in a policy framework uh, that uh, contains um, any, any broader fallout uh, for the financial system or, or for economies. So uh, containing systemic risk is certainly a policy objective of this uh, initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Tobias. Yes, the lady right here in the front. Thank you for taking my question. I'm Mao Ying Shong with Xinhua News Agency. I want to ask about the uh, US uh, Federal Reserve, because right now there has been some inflation surprises uh, in recent months, and maybe the Fed would consider delaying its rate cut. And if in interest rates are held higher for longer, uh, how do you evaluate the uh, impact uh, for the global financial market? Thank you. Thank you. you. So just on that question, we have another question that came in on a similar topic, uh, Pablo Pardo from El Mundo, and he asks, in case the Federal Reserve delays its monetary easing, what would be the impact on the US financial system? Yeah, those are, uh, of course, very relevant and very timely uh, questions. So um, let, me, let me start by pointing out that uh, the US economy has performed very strongly uh, since uh, the pandemic. Um, um, you know, uh, it, it has grown uh, 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 extremely uh, well, um, and there are a number of factors for that. Productivity growth has been strong. Um, there has also been labor force participation that has increased, um, and um, so a lot of uh, the variation in interest rates is really reflecting the strength of the economic performance uh, in the US. Um, so interest rates, longer term interest rates have indeed um, increased uh, in recent days. Um, and it's a combination of uh, surprises uh, for inflation, but also surprises in terms of economic uh, fundamentals. Um, uh, so, you know, that may have implications uh, for monetary policy. Our forecast remains that um, inflation will return to target, um, and our expectation is that the Federal Reserve is going to start uh, cutting at some point, but how many cuts and the exact timing is certainly data dependent. So maybe a couple of things to add. One, uh, a slightly different way to answer the question, it depends on what the economy, the US economy does. So if interest rates remain high, because uh, inflation progress is stalling, but the economy is continuing to grow strong, that's a positive backdrop. So if you think of like how equities are valuated, if earnings remain strong, if even if interest rates are rising, uh, that could be less of an impact. The concern we had in the GFSR would be one where the, the central banks, because inflation is stalling, keeps rates for longer, and has an impact on the asset price more broadly in line with the possible decline in economic activity that would have a much more meaningful impact on asset price, I think. There is also a second way to answer is there's a sectoral aspect to this. So, and I can pick an example, which is commercial real estate. Uh, commercial real estate is an example where there are about $1 trillion just in the US coming due in debt over the next year. The estimates of a gap there is about 300 billion. And we start seeing already, despite the economy being strong, a deterioration asset quality. You can see in, the fall rates in the commercial market backed security markets, you can see in charge of for banks. And that's specifically a weak tail of banks, the regional banks, that is more exposed to commercial real estate. So we look at various features of those in terms of exposure to commercial real estate, in terms of holding of securities. That was the cause of the crisis uh, in the banking sector last year in the US. It's about 475 billion of uh, held to maturity assets, for example. So where rates end up is gonna have an impact there. And so if you look at through the sectoral lens, so there's also an impact on different sectors. It's gonna be different where, depending on where the sector is in terms of health. Thank you. So I just wanted to stay on this topic because we got yet another question from uh, a reporter for Forbes Mexico, Silvia Rodriguez. She asks, uh, you know, what are the biggest challenges that emerging economies like Mexico will face in the face of a much slower decline in interest rates in the United States than expected? Yeah, let me start and then uh, perhaps Jason can uh, compliment me on the impact on emerging markets. So um, uh, there are really uh, two ways to think about that. So um, we have certainly seen an appreciation of the US dollar uh, in, in recent days as uh, uh, the uh, US economy 
uh, has performed very strongly, and that continues a trend of, of strong performance of the U.S. economy. And so a stronger dollar can um, uh, translate into a tighter financial conditions under some circumstances to some of the emerging markets. Having said that, there is a second uh, uh, important point to consider, which is that uh, the strength of the U.S. economy also has positive spillovers on emerging markets such as, uh, such as Mexico. So uh, demand from the U.S. may be stronger and the easing of financial conditions more broadly can also be transmitted. So the net effect can actually be positive or negative. So just looking at the exchange rate is probably not sufficient. Uh, uh, Jason, do you want to um, add on that? Sure, two years. Um, thanks for the question. Um, let's first recognize that uh, many emerging markets have been quite resilient uh, throughout the past two years in the face of repeated uh, global shocks, including interest rate hikes. One of the reasons why this is the case is because of improved policy frameworks, and some central banks haven't moved uh, early. So um, in, the in light of potential higher for longer, particularly in the first scenario that Tobias has outlined, um, emerging markets will surely be tested again. Um, here it is important uh, for them to maintain uh, appropriate uh, policy frameworks in order to build buffers both in terms of the monetary, uh, on the monetary side, as well as um, more medium term on the fiscal side as well, in order to preserve this resilience. We should also uh, probably recognize that um, there's a large differentiation across um, emerging markets. In Latin America, the policy differential vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. Uh, in terms of interest rate differential is still positive, but in some other regions, you know, that um, uh, policy uh, difference is diminishing. So there could be a differentiated impact on emerging markets if we were to continue on uh, in a higher for longer world. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. I see, Marine, you had a follow-up on the U.S. dollar? Hi, I'm Marine from The Times. Sorry about my hoarse voice. <clears throat> Just to follow up, given the, the risks of sticky inflation in some countries and inflation falling in others, there's a risk of monetary divergence. Are you calling on central banks to try and coordinate their loosening to limit the potential for financial volatility? And if they don't want to coordinate, what are the risks of divergence and where could we see the channels for that risk being transmitted inside financial markets? Um, are there any other questions on a similar uh, vein? Talking about sticky inflation and dollar. Okay. The gentleman in the front, please. Excuse me. Right here, the gentleman in the front. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Shuta Kaoka, working from GG Press, Japanese news agency. Not only emerging market, but also Japan advanced economy uh, have some uh, pressure from uh, uh, appreciation of US dollar. And what is your view on that point? Could the, could the FX market volatility pose some risk uh, at the global level? Right. Uh, on the US dollar, okay. Uh, quite a lot of interest in the US dollar here. Okay. That context. My name is Dina Salem. I work with Al Qahira News uh, Channel in Cairo, Egypt. Um, many low-income uh, countries have been following the global trend of uh, tightening monetary policy. Um, in an attempt, obviously, uh, to curb inflation, but this hasn't been helping on the ground. I mean, I was here last year and. Um, the prices have uh, been blown up compared to this year when converted to the local currency. I'm sure this is a scenario faced by many low-income countries. Can you still uh, recommend uh, this policy to be implemented by central banks in low-income countries? Thank, Thank you. you. I think now we can take it. <laughs> Sounds good, yeah. So uh, let me start um, uh, with... Um, you know, uh, monetary policy across countries. And um, I would point out that central banks, um, you know, follow very closely about what's going on with other central banks around the world. Um, and uh, so there's certainly um, exchange of views. Um, and, uh, you know, the IMF as well as, as other uh, international financial institutions are certainly forums where uh, central bankers uh, exchange views. Uh, but, um, you know, this is not per se coordination, right? Because 
uh, central banks uh, really have domestic mandates, right? Um, they are uh, mandated to deliver price stability and financial stability uh, in their countries. And so while it's very important to understand what is going on around the world, the mandates are, are domestic mandates. Um, so, um, um, you know, uh, when uh, central banks conduct monetary policy, of course, uh, they are taking many factors into account, which are all uh, influencing uh, uh, how uh, the objectives are going to be attained. Um, and the exchange rate uh, is an important uh, uh, factor uh, for many central banks. Um, um, you know, we have um, a policy framework called the Integrated Policy Framework uh, that is really uh, uh, mainly aimed at, at uh, you know, smaller open economies or emerging markets to think about the interaction of monetary policy, exchange rate policies, as well as macroprudential policies, and how you trade off these sort of like multiple tools, so including the interest rate, but also FX interventions, capital flow measures, and macroprudential measures to achieve uh, targets in an optimal fashion. Um, so, uh, you know, when we are looking at sort of like exchange rate movements uh, to date, uh, we do uh, find that they are largely driven by interest rate differentials. So, as I pointed out at the beginning, you know, uh, longer term real yields, for example, in the US have been increasing. Um, and that is really reflective of the of the uh, uh, strong performance of the U.S. economy relative to other countries, and so that has an impact uh, on exchange rates. So, you know, to first order, that's a very, very good proxy for, for how exchange rates are moving. Now, under this orderly market conditions, uh, uh, there can be circumstances where exchange rate volatility is excessive, where um, uh, some FX intervention uh, could be appropriate, but it really depends on the, on the particular circumstances. Yeah, maybe adding, like, if you step back for a second, go back to the pandemic, uh, there was a common shock that affected economies across the globe, and so there was a very synchronized policy response in terms of monetary policy. Once inflation starts coming back, some emerging markets start actually uh, raising interest rate earlier, and that, to Jason's point, helped their resilience. Or some countries use fiscal policy more than others. But it was more or less the story was about convergence, if you want. The story now is about if divergence. Uh, different countries are in different parts of the business cycle. Some countries have been more successful than others in bringing inflation down toward target. So I think it's appropriate for the policy response to be tailored to the country's circumstances. And so what we suggest in terms of monetary policy, for example, is that uh, central banks should not ease prematurely and should push back against market expectation if they're overly optimistic. But if inflation is actually coming down, gradually is sustainable toward the target, that they might actually reduce the tight stance of policy, moving gradually to an easy, st more neutral stance of policy. Similarly for fiscal policy. Fiscal policy can actually help the disinflationary process, but it's also a function of country circumstances. Some countries like the US resort to fiscal policy more aggressively than others. So I think it, the story is about divergence now in terms of performance and in terms of policy response. Let me uh, just come back to the question about Egypt and low-income countries uh, more broadly. Um, so, um, uh, of course, Egypt is a middle-income country, but um, so, you know, in, in uh, many countries uh, where we have programs uh, or, uh, uh, you know, there are um, uh, inflationary pressures that are not only related to monetary conditions but also to fiscal conditions, right? And so uh, monetary policy alone is probably not enough to address the inflation issue. You also need to take strong fiscal measures and, um, uh, you know, this is where uh, IMF programs can be very helpful in terms of uh, getting uh, countries on a sustainable path uh, for the macroeconomy in general, which uh, really includes uh, a monetary and fiscal policy mix. Uh, but uh, these can be, you know, challenging, um, uh, challenging uh, uh, tasks to accomplish and may take uh, some time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the reporter on the last row there, can you stand up? Right there with the glasses. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Janardhan Varel. I'm uh, from Nepal. Uh, 
in many low income countries such as Nepal, transition of monetary policy is weak, uh, especially in terms of uh, inflation control and balance of payment repair of the uh, bank and financial institutions. Uh, in these countries, controlling inflation through monetary policy is challenging uh, because non, uh, drive, uh, non monetary policy drivers uh, of inflation are very powerful. Uh, what are your recommendations to tackle this uh, scenario? Thank you. Yeah, so again, uh, I, I, I just talked about that a little bit, right? In, in, in many low-income countries, um, uh, you know, it's, it's not only the monetary conditions, but also the fiscal conditions that are key drivers of, um, of inflation. And um, so, um, you know, broader macroeconomic adjustments are really necessary <laughs> Uh, to get to uh, to more stable uh, macroeconomic outcomes, you know we're working very closely, of course, with authorities uh, on the monetary policy issues as well as the fiscal issues and and structural uh, economic issues. Thank you, um, uh, Larry. Um, the gentleman in the middle over here. of The Guardian, you say uh, that the financial markets are primed for a soft landing, you know, interest rates coming down, inflation coming down, growth remaining positive. Um, we've been here before many times, um, and you talk about bumps in the road. Um, how big a threat to that soft landing scenario is what's going on in the Middle East, and could markets be riding for a quite bumpy period? Yeah, thanks so much. Um, uh, we are, uh, of course, very concerned uh, with developments uh, in the Middle East and, and other parts of the world. Um, you know, uh, so far, uh, uh, since last week, uh, we have seen um, some uh, selling in, uh, in risky assets. So stock markets uh, have come down globally. Um, I think on Friday, um, uh, the broad index is, is about 2 to 3 percent down uh, globally, uh, and uh, Monday there was a further uh, decline. Um, you know, oil prices uh, have uh, uh, been fairly stable, and um, so, you know, the, the question going forward is really uh, the magnitude of uh, any uh, uh, broadening. Uh, of uh, uncertainty and, and downside uh, realizations. Um, so uh, the, the level of the oil price and, and commodity prices more broadly is certainly one transmission factor. The other transmission factor is uh, uh, uncertainty. As I uh, pointed out at the beginning, uh, financial market uh, volatility is very compressed, but this underlying uncertainty may be high and may be that uh, financial market volatility moves closer to uh, measures of uh, uh, underlying economic volatility, and that could certainly lead uh, to a repricing of, uh, of assets. Um, I would also uh, point out uh, that such a scenario could uh, lead uh, to um, uh, pressures on inflation, so headline inflation uh, could uh, uh, have upward pressures uh, around the world as, as commodity prices, potentially food prices, uh, could be pressured up. So that could lead to a repricing of interest rates and then the kind of channel uh, of, of pressuring some, uh, some banks and some other financial markets due to higher interest rates uh, could come back into play. Thank you. Uh, the lady here in the white, please. Thanks very much. Good morning. Christine Munro from Deutsche Welle. Um, could you talk a little bit about what your sense is um, pertaining to the African continent, the debt levels we have? A number of countries are already in dis, uh, debt distress and many others are headed in that direction. Um, at what point is this a debt crisis in, in the region? Thank you. Are there any other questions on Africa? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll get to you. Right here and then Simon, I'll get to you. Thank you. My name is Nano Yankwa. I report for Asasi Radio in Ghana. I would like to know what you anticipate to be the impact of the geopolitical tension on financial systems in Africa, especially sub-Saharan Africa, and specifically on Ghana. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll take the gentleman there on Africa still. 
Thank you. Simon Akteba with Today News Africa in Washington, D.C. Uh, two quick questions on Africa. What are the key findings and implications of the Global Financial Stability Report for African economies, considering their unique financial landscape and vulnerabilities? And finally, how does the IMS assess the potential spillover effect from global financial stability on African market? And what measure does the IMF recommend for African policymakers to enhance financial resilience and mitigate systemic risk? Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, for these uh, question, uh, you know, three questions on Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, we work, of course, very closely with uh, many countries in uh, in Africa, um, uh, both in programs uh, as well as uh, through capacity development. Um, so, uh, in our uh, department, the Monetary and Capital Markets Department, we are engaged. Uh, with uh, the majority of countries um, in capacity building on uh, central bank issues, debt management issues, uh, as well as um, uh, financial regulation issues. So, you know, capacity building is, is in the medium term, uh, extremely important uh, to really uh, make sure that the banking system, the central banks, and the debt management offices uh, are up to the task uh, to, uh, uh, to bring a positive growth impulse from uh, financial markets uh, to the countries. Um, of course, um, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa has been hit very hard by the pandemic. So when you look at sort of like growth performance relative to pre-crisis projections, there's quite a bit of a gap, and that's quite different from advanced economies or emerging markets. Um, and uh, so uh, many countries in Africa are struggling uh, with debt uh, and low growth. Um, so we are engaged um, on uh, helping countries uh, to uh, adjust uh, macro um, uh, performance and, and debt levels uh, in particular. Um, so, you know, many countries are in negotiations uh, to restructure debt, uh, and that's an important uh, uh, element uh, in, in some cases. Um, and, uh, you know, we are working, um, you know, it's a little bit country specific uh, as to what the, what the right policy steps are. So I can't really go too much into detail. There is going to be a regional briefing that goes uh, more into country specific uh, issues. Um, uh, but, um, you know, we are, we are very closely uh, engaged on, on these issues. I don't know, Jason, whether you want to. Just a couple of supplements. Um, so uh, in line with what Tobias said about global financial conditions having eased over the past half a year, some sub-Saharan Africa nations were able to issue debt. Their sovereign spreads have declined. That, that said, um, in face of uncertainty, this picture may turn around and a number of countries still face debt challenges. Um, there is $60 billion of debt coming due um, over the next two years, external debt. Um, if you look across uh, the continents, countries that have uh, better macroeconomic adjustments have in general fed uh, better. With in, in the international markets and things like early contact with their debtors is, uh, is also helpful. To the question specifically about uh, Ghana, inflation has in in fact uh, reduced in Ghana on the back of tighter monetary policy and fiscal consolidation. So this seems to be the right direction of, of travel uh, for countries in the sub um, Saharan continent as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any last questions in the room? Um, yeah, the lady here in the orange. Hi, and thank you. Uh, I want to focus on private credit. Your team went out of its way to tell us about the risks, what they are, how much they're growing. By uh, issuing that chapter early, you had a panel uh, last week at NYU uh, where the industry uh, people were saying, yeah, there's some risks here, but basically we think this is a good form of credit and we're not so worried. So why did you go out of your way to emphasize it? And for everybody, remind us exactly what private credit is, how big are the risks, and what needs to be done? Thank you. Oh, and I'm Kathleen Hayes. Um, uh, there are in two, two last questions. Maybe we can take them a bunch. So the, so the lady here, and then the gentleman there. Hi, Su Chan from The Telegraph. Uh, back to interest rates and monetary policy. I think, Tobias, in your blog, you talked about risks of central backs, back, backpedaling 
on interest rates cut, cuts by doing them too soon. Could you spell out some of the consequences for financial markets and the economy if that happens? And is that risk greater for the global economy than, say, central banks holding interest rates too high for too long? Thank you. And then we're going to wrap up with the last question there, unless somebody has a follow-up on this. Yes, the gentleman over there. All right, my question is about the regional, mainly about the Asian side, the South Asian side, and primarily about Pakistan. When we are looking at uh, the prescription being given by the major organizations, all the international financial institutions, is more about increasing the interest rates. And most of the times, and especially the economy, related, uh, when we are referring to Pakistan, it's related to the supply side inflation. Continuously with that very dosage or that very prescription has kind of hurt the middle, middle income and the lower middle income. But, of course, it has not uh, given the results out there. Still, the inflation is 25% and beyond of that very country. For last, I would say, almost two years, we are seeing the maximum inflation. It is impacting somehow on, uh, like, lowering the inflation, but not to the real recipe, maybe. That's how one school of said thought. So how would you respond to that? Thank you. Uh, Tobias, so we had three different questions. Um, you know, private credit first, and then um, uh, take it in the order you'd like to. Yes, that's good. So I'm going to uh, start on e all three and then pass it to both Fabio and Jason to, to compliment me uh, on, on all three. So on private credit, um, you know, we really um, uh, try to take a, a balanced uh, view. Um, you know, there are both risks and opportunities. Um, and, um, you know, in terms of uh, the risks, uh, we do uh, recommend a, a more uh, uh, data collection in this area. Um, you know, it is uh, fairly opaque. Um, and, you know, uh, the market has, has grown rapidly um, and it may grow further. So having a better understanding for policymakers, but also market participants uh, to understand the landscape is, is certainly one uh, key recommendation. And Fabio can, can go deeper uh, into detail. By the way, we always launch these analytical chapters in advance. So this is nothing specific to, to this topic. So, uh, you know, chapters two and three are always uh, the, the, the week before. Um, in terms of, um, uh, you know, Pakistan and, um, uh, you know, other countries in the region, um, so, you know, my, my answer is going to be similar to, to, to previous uh, questions. Um, you know, Pakistan uh, is, is in the program and there are uh, really uh, macro challenges uh, which include uh, the financial sector uh, and, and uh, uh, central bank policies, uh, but also broader macro and, and fiscal uh, issues and, um, you know, uh, the adjustments uh, oftentimes uh, take uh, take some time uh, to uh, to take hold. Again, the regional briefings will go deeper into into those uh, specific uh, issues. And then the third question, I don't remember what it was. Backpedaling. Backpedaling. Oh, backpedaling. Oh, yeah, backpedaling. So you know, when we look across countries, right? So you know, some countries now have both upside and downside risks uh, to inflation. Other countries have more upside, others more downside risk. You know, the key message that we have to central banks is to make sure that inflation is heading durably back to target, right? So, you know, around the world, we do see uh, communication by central banks uh, uh, that expect to cut. Some central banks have already started to cut. Among advanced economies, Switzerland uh, started to cut. Um, emerging markets have started to cut much earlier. You know, Brazil, Mexico are good examples here. But the key is to make sure that we are durably back uh, to uh, inflation targets and, and, and not to sort of cut prematurely. Um, uh, that, is, that is really a key message. So let me turn to both Fabio and Jason to compliment. So on private credit, uh, maybe for those not into this specific segment, private credit, it's credit provided by non-bank financial institutions like investment funds for example, to firms that are too small to have access to public markets. So traditionally, they would borrow from the commercial banks. But now there's this growing sector that provides credit directly. It's called direct lending to these institutions, to these firms. The reason why we looked into this segment is the rapid growth primarily. The sector globally is more than two trillion now, about three quarters in the US. Um, so it's the rapid growth that was the impetus. I think if you step back, and it's part of a broader trend, right? This is a move from public markets to private markets that we have seen in equities before, 
and now we start seeing more in credit. There are other structural factors like activity shifting from the banking sector to the non-bank financial institution post GFC due to more stringent regulation, very low interest rates that push institutional investors to seek uh, higher returns. So there are some benefits for investors, higher returns is one, for firms to have a more access to alternative form of funding. And I think for the broad system, a more diversified funding base, I think it's good from a financial stability perspective. The risks that we focus are, one is about valuation. Those are not valuated, evaluated very frequently. So the stale valuation during periods of sharp readjustment could actually become an amplifier of shock. We look at the characteristics of the borrowers. Those are smaller, more levered than uh, firms in the public markets or that uh, have access to banks. We look at uh, what we call liquidity mismatch, so whether there's a risk of run from this fund, and I think the answer, generally speaking, is no, with the exception of the fast-growing segment that is being tailored to retail investors. Then we look at layers of leverage. That's a different layer of leverage here at the borrower level, at the private credit fund level, at this investor level. And so the, to be as pointed, opacity and lack of information, that's what made the assessment very hard for us to do. We can't get a good sense how this delay and possible deleverage would work because we don't have good data. And there are cross-border implications. Some of this is US firms lending in Europe too. And so just to conclude, the assessment is that at the present moment, we don't see an imminent financial stability risk, but given the rapid size and the fact that this sector account for about 7% of uh, lending to non-financial institution or firms in the US, it could become an amplifier of a shock if both banks and this sector cut down on lending at the same time in case of prolonged recession. Thank you. Maybe Jason. I, maybe I can add something about inflation in um, frontier economies. Um, it, it is indeed the case that um, both supply and demand side contrib contribute to inflation. So um, in that sense, policy is needed on both sides. In the case of Pakistan, for example, monetary policy has been tightening uh, over the past two or three years to control inflation, and inflation is projected to come down, but more work needs to be done. Um, and that includes on the demand side, uh, fiscal consolidation needs to be continued, but also on the supply side, including things like, you know, the reform of the energy sector, state-owned enterprises. And I think many economies um, in the frontier space actually face similar challenges as well. I think um, fund staff continues to uh, engage with Pakistan on uh, this issue, and um, I should echo Tobias that there will be a regional economic briefing uh, from the Middle East um, and Central Asia Department. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Jason, Fabio, Tobias. Um, and thanks very much for attending. Um, I just want to say, if you haven't got the report as yet, it will be online. If you need any follow-up questions, please reach out to me bilaterally. And uh, as we mentioned here, if you have any specific country-specific questions, we have regional briefings both on Thursday and Friday, and all that information is in our media center. So again, thank you so much for attending the press conference. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.